Hello everyone, welcome to the Destillation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music. Be that rock, punk, metal or even extreme metal on the good days. Coming up on this week's show, we've got all the latest news from around the world in seven days. Uh, there's a lot of news this week to, cap- to play catch up on. The last few weeks where we've been pretty, pretty low on the ground. We've got updates from the likes of Guns N' Roses, Napalm Death and The Ghost Inside. We've got loads of new music out, a new album released. Our reviews this week go a little bit more low-key, a little bit more unknown names, which hopefully should bring them a little bit of love because they deserve it. We've got Buchan Gase, The Anchorage, and Near the Knife. And Open Mic this week comes from In Flames, and it's their 2006 controversial hit, we'll call it, uh, Come Clarity. So, as ever, we shall begin with the news. And starting off with former Dunger Escape Plan drummer Billy Reimer. Uh, now, Mr. Billy has a new band called Thought Crimes. They have a debut song out already called, oh, I have to Google how to pronounce this, Artificer, I think it is. Uh, don't know what it means. Uh, there's an EP coming out later on this year, and it sounds like super punky mathcore. It's on the same kind of level as... I hear a lot of... I tried not to compare it to Dillinger, because that's the easy way out. But there is a lot of overlap, I think. That more... What was the album that came after I March? When they go like proper spacey and proggy, less so, but I can't think what the fucking album's called. It is Ioworks. I think it is the Ioworks one I'm thinking of. More Ioworks level um, Dinger Escape Plan. I also looked at them as not akin to Distrage from, or Distrage from Italy, and Every Time I Die. And it's a lot of fun, and I'm quite looking forward to the EP, and apparently it's due out this year, so yay. Duff McKagan has said that... Is that how you said his name? McKagan? McCargan? I'm going to stick with McKagan. McKagan sounds better. Duff McKagan has said that Axl Rose has some magnificent stuff geared up for the new Guns N' Roses album. Very excited. Speaking with radio DJ Eddie Trunk, McKagan stated, I've heard some magnificent stuff from Axl... Sorry, I'll try that again. I have... I've heard some magnificent stuff that Axel has. Really cool stuff he's been working on. So I'm excited about the possibility. About, yeah, about the possibilities with that. Of course, I don't want. I don't mean to get anybody rabid. Am I fucking dyslexic? Jesus Christ! A new GNR album will happen when it happens. That's for sure. But the fun part and the cool part about Guns N' Roses is we don't really talk about it. And what happens next just happens. It's never really been a band that there's a direct schedule of how we do things. Fuck! I don't know why I struggle with that. Basically, he's saying that Axel has some lovely stuff geared up. There's no set time on a new GNR album because they like to just do things as it happens. But Slash earlier on in the year said that there was... Well, he all but confirmed there was a new album being made. Um, and I, I am intrigued. Colour me intrigued because I'm one of the few people who completely rep for Chinese democracy. I don't know if that's because that was the first GNR album that I probably went into. But I rep for that album and... I think Axel, as much as he is completely bonk- bonkers, he has calmed down a bit, maybe? So, and after doing everything with ACDC earlier on the year, I think his, and the, I just read the once, no, yeah, Once in Your Lifetime tour went on for two years, so, it's safe to say his vocals still hold up, so yeah, I am very looking forward to a new GNR album sometime in the future. Feel good moment of the week comes from the ghost inside. Last week I said about they were doing a save the date teaser for the 13th of July. They've confirmed what that is. It is a comeback show. It's going to be their first show since the 2015 bus crash. They will play the Shrine in Los Angeles, California. And it's, it's like I said, it's a feel good thing. I say last week I've never really gone into ghost inside that much, but... Any band who went through what they do have more more than enough rights to do or whatever the fuck they want. They could have easily just went, you know what, lads, it was a bit much. We're going to call it a day. But they've been fighting since it happened and fucking more power to them. Really hope it all goes well for them. Uh, there's a slightly weirder end of the scape- spectrum now. There's a campaign to get Napalm Death, you know, that really angry grindcore band from Birmingham, to play... MTV Music Week, uh, which is definitely a pop festival. Uh, so MTV Music Week takes place in Plymouth, rep in Plymouth, between June 5th and June 8th. And currently uh, it's 
featuring Little Mix and Jess Glynn. And Booker's Paddy Power have offered 12 to 1 odds on Napalm Death appearing. I don't know where it's come from, but they just plucked a number out of their ass and said, look, we're still relevant. That Paddy Power, I mean, not Napalm Death. Uh, the, the whole movement, I guess, because I suppose it is all the same sort of long as hashtag why not dying fetus, but oh well. It's gone so much attention that the local Plymouth newspaper, Plymouth Herald, are currently running a ro- uh, running a poll on their website to see who people want to appear on the bill, including Napalm Death. Have you even made light in it in the article, basically saying they just done like a brief rundown on the band or the brief, brief bio, saying that realistically it's unlikely that the band will play, but let's all have a bit of fun. Which fair play to the Herald, to be honest. Um, of course, I voted for it, and when I did, they were at eighty-seven percent for Napalm Death. So. I think we all know what we have to do. Plymouth Herald website, just do a Google, and yeah, it'll all be there. Mike Shinoda has said that he is open to finding a new vocalist for Linkin Park. He's open to the idea. Uh, in an interview with Rock Antenna, which I've spelt wrong in my notes, we all thrive um, We all thrive making and performing music, says Shinoda. I know the other guys, they love to be on stage, they love to be on the studio, and so they do. so to not do that would be like... I don't know, almost like unhealthy. Uh, it's not my goal to look actively look for a new singer. If it does happen, it has to happen naturally. If we find someone that is a great person and a good stylistic fit, I could see us trying to do some stuff with somebody. I would never want to feel like we are replacing Chester, which I think is a really, really nice statement and a really nice um, like uh, thought process they have behind it. So it's a... Uh, there's a lot of bands who will rush to get a new singer in because for various different reasons. But he has said, like, if it happens, it happens. If not, then... To me, it sounds like they'll either carry on without or they'll just try a new project. But, again, similar to the Ghost Inside sort of situation, members of Linkin Park are in it, can pretty much do what they like and it's not for us to judge them otherwise. So, again... More power to him. I hope it all turns out for the best for them, or as best as it can be given the circumstances. Ending on a slightly more chipper note, 29 new bands have been announced for Arc Tangent Festival. This is the t- uh, mostly mathy, proggy festival in well, set in Bristol. It's going from the August 15th to August 17th. I really want to go. Uh, the 20 new bands are as follows. You have Carpenter Brute, Polyphia, The Ocean, Pigs, 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 Pigs. Legit, that's what they called. Uh, Tosca, Covet, Yvette Young, Nordic, Gi- uh, Nordic Giants, Zoo, Gnod, hope I pronounced that right, Sleep Token, Elephant Jim, Palm Reader, Matt Calvert, Cocaine Piss, Bats, Good Game, The St. Pierre Snake Invasion. All right. Ithaca, oh my God, Puerto Austral, sure. DJ Perro, Kagu, Dags, Doble Kappa, AMNT, All the Best Tapes, Cult Drop, I think that's how it's meant to be pronounced, Two Pista, and Rad Pit. Why do math bands have such a weird fucking name? Jesus Christ. Uh, I know there's a lot of the, but there's some of the bands in there that I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, that was going. Uh, Palm Reader are a great hardcore band. I think they were top five albums last year for me. Uh, Carpenter Brute are along the re-emerging like 80s synth pop not synth pop synth wave um movement along with Pirates Beta and that kind of thing and what was the other one that caught my eye I can't even see it now oh the might be oh it was the ocean uh, another big dramatic gen prog band and ting uh, they joined the likes of obviously Headliners Meshuggah you've got Cult of Luna in there The Black Queen Zelanadas Daughters Frontier Condra, uh, Burton Row, and the like. Uh, yeah, it's shaping up to be a jolly, jolly good time. And like I said, I can't go. Anyway, moving on. So that's all the news from this week. There's loads of new music out. We're going to start with Mark Morton, the Lamb of God guitarist. Obviously, he's got a new album coming out uh, 1st of March. It's called Aesthetic. It's spelt wrong, and it hurts me every time I see it written down. The new song is called Save Defiance and it features vocals from Mr. Miles Kennedy. He of uh, Alter Bridge fame. I cannot remember. Is it Mayfield 4? Something like that. There's 
Bam before Alter Bridge. It does. He's known mostly for Alter Bridge at this point, and also Slash. Um, he features on vocals. You've also got Ray Lutzia from Korn and Mike, Mike Inez. Eines, I don't know how to pronounce that name, from Alice in Chains. It, whereas the Chester song, it was a, it did feel like a groove metal song with Chester doing vocals. This one feels more like it was catered to Miles' style of music. It's very, it reminds me of the heavier spectrum of um, Alter Bridge's back catalogue. I like uh, Metangulus or... What was the lead single from Last Hero? It had a very dramatic, drawn. Why can I never remember anything? Either way, heavy end of the ultimate spectrum. It's less supreme, groovy sort of thing that Mark's good for. It's still a good song. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was. It's less what he's done before. That's what. That's. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Grand. Either way, D Duff McKagan. Remember him from like five minutes ago? He's got a new sign up. It's called Tenderness. There's no album confirmed with it. It's just a southern soft rock ballad. Um, and it's basically around all the pain he sees throughout the Once in Your Life album tour, which I just realized not only went to your standard North America, Europe, but it went to South Africa, it went to Asia, I think it went to South America as well. It's literally been all over the shop. And I imagine along the way he's seen some pretty staggering thing so fair it's not my kind of thing it's very very you know chilling in the evening with your parents kind of music but that's just my opinion go check it out if that sounds like your cup of tea or moonshine devon townsend this is one that really got me excited for today Dev devon townsend has a new song out called genesis it is part of his empath album and it's part of the his actual solo not project or band it's him it's very confusing um yeah empath is out the 29th of march and genesis is is huge electronic symphonic progressive heavy fucking metal with a batshit insane music video and the song is utterly amazing i love it love it and yeah i can't wait for empath out ne end of next month uh mike shinoda again remember him from four minutes ago He's released two new songs as part of the deluxe release of his 2018 album, Post Traumatic. Uh, the first one is Prove You Wrong, which is a very, which is a piano back rap song. Very, very good, actually. And the other one is What the Words Meant, which is more a dreamy, electro rock kind of thing. I was reading that a lot. The Post Traumatic album for him was like quite therapy to get to not get over, but to help deal with his feelings following uh, the passing of Chester. And from what I've read, a lot of fans felt the same way. It was a good um, outlet, I guess, and a good way to harbour emotions and feelings. So the album's got a job. I'm all for it. I, I'll, I'll admit, I gave it a miss. Uh, the few songs I had in the lead up to it wasn't really my kind of thing. But if it's helping people, then you can't really go wrong, can you? Molly Crew, remember when they said they were retiring forever and they were never going to do anything ever again? Well, they've got a new song out. It's called The Dirt and established 1981 because, yeah. Uh, it features vocals from Machine Gun Kelly because Machine Gun Kelly is in the new Motley Crew film called The Dirt. See how they've done that? Which is also based on a collaborative autobiography called The Dirt. You can't ever say glam metal stars aren't smart. Um, it is a mid-paced 80s, very, very 80s glam song with an equally 80s and thematic chorus. I actually quite like it as much shit as I'm giving Motley Crue. Um, and yeah, when I read that it featured Machine Gun Kelly, I was expecting the worst. He's only got like one verse, which lyrically is very Motley Crue. It just, I hear the word tits a lot and that strikes me as something that Motley Crue like to sing about. And other than that, yeah, he plays... Um, I was going to say Tommy Lee Cooper then. That's fucking right. It's just Tommy Lee, isn't it? Either way, he plays... Actually, no, I'm not going to do it either way because that's going to bother me. Can't spell. Yeah, he plays Tommy Lee... In the film, uh, the drummer, because that's what Tommy does also. Yeah. And yeah, it's the music video that comes along with it is a bouncing between clips from the movie and clips from 
music videos and them just performing live in general. It looks like it's going to be on par with Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocketman. Really like the fact that they're making more of these kind of films. Let's with someone at work. <coughs> Excuse me. That. But he thinks, based on the success of Bohemian Rhapsody, he's seen that this new Elton John was coming out called Rocketman. And that's going to be one that tests the water. Sort of like how um, Iron Man was testing the waters for like, this big the uh, Avengers franchise. If Rocketman does well also, then it could mean that there's a lot more scope for other bands to get on board with this sort of thing, which I'm all for. I think they've already started with some cracker names. Queen, Elton John and Motley Crue. Just want them to do a Guns N' Roses one. The last song, mm, second to last song that's been released from this week is by Weezer. They've got two out. They've got High as a Kite and Living in LA, and it's all going to go part of the Black Album that's also out the 1st of March. 1st of March, for some reason, it's really, really fucking popular. Uh, High as a Kite is a standard, floaty, power pop song that's just done very well in a very Weezer kind of way. Living in LA is not that. It is not that at all. It is a very up-temple, dance, poppy kind of song. I prefer High as a Kite for that reason. And... I say second to last because Grand Magus have a new song out to go with the new album that's been released, being announced, announced, definitely not released yet, but not in April. Uh, so yeah, Grand Magus, which do a very epic sounding traditional heavy metal sound, they've got a new song, new song and album. They are both called the same thing, called Wolf God. It's coming out the nineteenth of April. It's going to be their ninth studio album, and yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that. I've been. They've always been a greatest hits band for me ever since I just, I remember getting a Metal Hammer years and years ago and it basically said here are the top 10 albums from every kind of genre. And then the Trad Heavy Metal had Iron Will by Grand Magus and from there I keep taking like songs out from each album so Iron, Iron Will I had in full for a while and I think I've lost it. Um, Iron Will, Hammer of the North, I think I missed The Hunt. And then Triumph and Power, and yeah, glossed over sword songs, but now Wolf God, looking forward to that, still a nuclear blast, and I'm going to, I think I was going to say I'm going to give that a listen, or something along those lines, I forgot my train of thought, because you'll never know it, but as I was recording, the post he came, because I fucking knew he would, absolutely could guarantee <clears throat> that he was going to come up as soon as I was recording, because fuck you, that's why. Um, so yeah, I imagine I had a very interesting point. I doubt that, actually. All the main information is Grand Vegas, Wolf God, 19th of April. Jobs are good. And let's just go into album reviews because it's been a farce so far. We're going to start with Buchan Gase with their third studio album called Scholars. They are from Hudson, New York, and they play an experimental indie rock kind of thing. And they're quite interesting. So it's a duo. It is Aaron Dyer. I hope I pronounced that first name right. And Aaron Sanchez to make things extra awkward. Um, Daya is the vocalist and she plays a buke, which is a modified six string baritone ukulele. And Sanchez plays a gase, hence the name, and is a guitar bass hybrid. And they make a full band sound with effects and pedals on their instruments and their vocals. And they also have a bunch of foot instruments. So they've got a toe tambourine. Um, I watched some live footage and they've got like a bass drum pedal that they just have in front of them. And um, they sometimes have like a snare attached as well. And more recently, I think for this album, they've engineered something called the Arcs. Um, it is a multi-instrument electronic control system, which I think can just do like loops and effects and other other such electrical bass musicianship um and with all that combined it's not despite the fact there's only two of them it is not empty sounding at all you wouldn't have guessed that there's only two of them without reading about them uh so it starts off with a low drum psychedelia influenced crawler it's called stumbler and um, it's almost hypnotic in its vocal execution it's very in the by the background you've got like very plodding drums and it's the way she sort of like chants and mantra at you. It's very, very fun. Um, it's not indicative as the album as a whole, but then I think about it, no one song is. If you take 
any one of these songs out of the album, there is there's that's no way of in of figuring out what the entire album is. There's a lot of different um, genres going on, lots of different ideas. Obviously, as the name suggests, lots of different experiments, and it's quite unique based on the fact that they are not really. Well, I guess yeah, they are making their own instruments and like making it. I was going to say make it was looking along. That sounds really mean. That's not what I meant. It's all very DIY. It's all very. This is what they wanted. They're not really gonna um, adhere to what other people would want them to do. And for me, it's track two with it, which is the title track. Well, obviously, scholars. That's where the album for me properly begins. Um. And in there, it's got a lot of the different genres and musical types that's going to be found throughout the album. So there's lots of art folk in there, lots of pop, stoner, lots of indie sound of music. And it shows off um, our own vocal range. And the thing that really um, popped out to me is other experimental bands that I've listened to rely a bit too much and because they're experimental they feel like they can get away with a lot more so they can get away with having weird and wacky vocals like uh the Venean process octave which i reviewed last year and diablo swing orchestra they do like to have like weird effects and just like sing oddly if that makes sense whereas this is at moments like that are very few and far between as a whole our own voice our own, in general, just has a lot more control over her voice, and she knows how to use it. She knows when to sing. She knows when to hit the higher notes. She knows when to be a little bit more kooky. She kn- she's very intelligent on how to use a voice in this kind of setting. And past this song, like throughout the album, the puke that it's going to get very confused. I'm just going to try to stick to the last name. Last name. So the puke that Aaron Sanchez plays. It kind of remi- reminds me of like the low, like the muted notes. You know when, like from Apocalyptica, when they're doing like more verse riffs and it's just like the, the palm muted. It's not strumming, is it? Is it strumming? Whatever it is, cellos do. They're like dum 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 dum. dum. It, yeah, I, you can tell I'm not a musician, can't you? Anyway, into Derby. Just to ignore all of that. Derby takes it into a complete different direction again. Um, Stumbler and Scholars had a much more dark feeling about them, whereas Derby is a lot more laid back. It's got like a reggae brass rhythm to it, and Edge is close, a little bit closer to pop than the other songs did. And then the album probably picks up again at around track seven at Grips. Again, Dyer's voice really steals the show on this song a lot, especially, especially on the chorus. Um, it's low key broody verse into this big vocally powerful chorus it kind of reminds me of gold key with um thingy stairs lags from uh gallows and that sort of thing it's a fucking great album i highly recommend you listen to that as well um the final third i must admit of the album is kind of hit and miss um no land is kind of is the level of dark moody pop that can be seen in the mainstream i think that is like Outside of Flock, that is like one of the better moments on this on the th- final third. Um, it can be it, I've compared to like Lordy and Tovalo because it is like like I said, dark and broody, but it is hugely accessible. Um, but yeah, the ultimate um, highlight in the latter portion of the album is Flock. It's very bassy electro pop, and at this point, if you hadn't forgotten already, this song will make you forget that there's only two people in there. And, yeah, the Muddy Water lyric in it will get stuck in your head for a very long time. Overall, I quite enjoy this album. I haven't given it justice by my words, but then I never do. But I really enjoy this album. It will take a couple of listens if you are unfamiliar with, like, the weirder end of music, which is, you know, it's fine. I've gotten in the end. I, you you can hear how small my brain is. Um, there's just a lot going on, and it's... Very interesting, the musical setup that Dyer and Sanchez has. You think about it, it is only two. They, and when you, I saw, like I said, Fudge them playing live, and it's still just the two of them. They don't have, or at least the shows I watched, they don't have um, 
like backing musicians just to help out or anything like that. Everything is done by just those two. And I think it's really interesting. For the fans of part, I compared them to Gold Key earlier. I still would the way they sort of, the way um, Dyer, there we go. The way Dyer um, controls her voice and uses the voice it reminds me a lot of Gold Key, which I, like I said, mentioned earlier. In terms of like this weird end of music, I did have to do a bit of searching and I found a lot of crossover with a band called Era, E-E-R-A, so if you're familiar with them. Also Marnie Stern, which I have listened to before. And uh, again, yeah, I think there's a lot of good crossover there. So Gold Key, Era, uh, Marnie Stern. You'll go for Buchan Gase with their third album, Scholars. I don't know why particularly I can't talk today. Words English good, right? The Anchorage is what we're going to look at next. Uh, it's a third EP. It's called What We Go Through, and they're from Salt Lake City, Utah. I know things, and they play a sort of. It's unfair to call them ska punk. There is a bit of punk in there, but not to try and class. Excuse me, to try and classify them as a whole. They are more alternative rock, I'll say, but I'll get to more what they are. Musically in a bit, but yeah, it like scary alternative rock kind of thing. Um, I found the Anchorage and thought, yeah, just it's just going to be some easy listening ska punk for me to digest. It's going to be a lot more easier to listen to than and a lot of the post metal album that I've just, like with post metal and the Buchan Gaze, you probably got to like focus on it and find the intricacies. I thought with this, it's going to be very easy listening, very just chilled laid back fun time kind of thing and it is a fun time but there's a lot more beneath the surface and i'm almost ashamed that i glossed over it all uh if you take away the bass bass the brass from the opening song weird night sleepy day honestly it does challenge one arm scissor by at the drive-in musically um, in fact, I'd even say it challenges one arm scissor if it was fronted by Jim Ward the entire way, instead of whichever quadruple barrel name sings it instead. I always get confused between Omar and I can't even remember the other one's name at the moment. Um, the choruses do revert back to that more scary, rocky, scary punk kind of sound. Um, the riffs post chorus are just they are what really initially triggered me to think hang on a minute are they just covering it underneath no they're just very very clever with it all <clears throat> excuse me the the song that really goes to the, the scar punk stereotype that i was talking about before and what i thought this was going to be is track three donny um the brass work the sort of brass section is evan wharton eric walknick walking I knew I was going to get that wrong. I spelled it wrong earlier. Um, Miles Lawrence, they play a selection of um, trumpets, trombones, and saxophones. Um, they are like the lead instrument in Donny. And they play they play the riffs whilst the guitarists play like the usual scratch effect kind of thing. And then at the 2 minute 30 mark, the rest of the band, so that's um, Derek Harmon on vocals. Jason Bohan on drums and then Jake Bills on bass. They come in, also Harmon does guitars. They come in and go full punk rock on the song as well. So you have got that little bit of ska punk in there. But it's so, like, I really want to stress, it's so much more than just a standard ska punk um, record or EP. There is, I think it's more in tune with... Um, post up. Post hardcore so broad now, but like the very how can I put it? the alt rock influence post rock, I should say. So not post rock, sorry, the alt rock influence post hardcore. I will get my words right around there. Um, the next song, hold on, is a lot more, more relaxed. It's a like it's borderline reggae kind of track, and it sounds like it's from from James by. <laughs> It sounds like it's fronted by James from Death Havana, which was a weird band to be like caught in my head when I was listening to this. Not a band I would expect to be talking about anytime soon. And the whole thing ends with one of these days, which sounds like 
a streetlight manifesto covering Billy Talent. It starts off with your usual ska punk kind of affair before exploding into this very, very punk heavy, borderline post hardcore, like I said before, chorus. Um, I'm really staggered this hasn't picked up more. Like, I feel that, for me at least, every like rock music phase that I grew up with had had a moment in this album. So you've got ska in there, you've got punk, you've got pop punk, you've got post hardcore, you've got alternative rock. It's all there, so I feel like this should be more widely known and more widely listened to and catered for, but I'm shrugging my shoulders. You can't see that, but just know I'm shrugging my shoulders saying I don't know. Um, if you are a fan of Street Light Manifesto, I mentioned it earlier, um, you'll go for this. I think Sonic Boom, Sips, yeah, Sonic Boom 6 as well. I know they do a lot more... Um, Hip hop kind of things with the sound as well, but when they are more scary alt rock kind of thing, then you could easily go for Anchorage. I can. Kids in the Multiculture is the one that springs to mind. Um, and there's a song. It's a. Yes, it's a song. That's 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 fucking great. I can see the music video, and that's why it's irritating me. But as it's carrying on, um, also Rocket from the Crypt as well because. Similarly to the Anchorage, Rocket from Grit kind of get um, stereotyped as, oh, it's a punk band, where there's so much more to their sound and there's so much more interesting as a part of that. Yeah, Kids in the Multiculture. Um, sorry, going back to the Sonic Boom 6 point. Forget you can't see this. A little bit of Virus as well. Mostly the like self the self-titled album. There's a lot of crossover there. And yeah, I think Rocket from the Crypt, in the same way that they are, they get pigeonhole that's this one thing when you actually listen to them you realize there's a lot more going on same sort of thing for the anchorage so trail up manifesto sonic boom six rock from the crypt like any of them i suggest you give the anchorage a go it is their ep what we go through and i'm really sorry lads that i didn't do the words good final new release album of this week will come from year of the knife from delaware it is their technically the debut album. It's called Ultimate Aggression. They are a very, very brutal hardcore band. Um, it's, from my understanding, it's a re-recording of two EPs. So it's Ultimate Disease and First Day Aggression. See, Ultimate Aggression. Ta-da! Um, they reintroduced themselves with a statement of intent on opener YOTK, which is just very low-end, almost, um, is it Slam? The genre, the slam beat, yeah, sure. It's almost like slam riffs with um, the vocalist, who I'm not quite sure. They haven't assigned names. I'm very, very bad if they don't assign names. And vocalist just screaming wild to care at you, and it's fucking terrifying because he sounds like amplified death, which is fun. It's some low end, low end um, sludgy riffs on the back of some pounding double bass, and it really picks up towards the end, and it which then explodes seamlessly into Ultimate Disease, which track two. Um, Ultimate Disease is a lot faster, it's a lot more confrontational. Um, lyrically, it just fucking goes at the government. Kind of wondering if it's... Because they talk about like the higher-ups of the government instead. So I don't know if it's going directly at President Trump. Um, I was going to say, yeah, President Trump. I don't know why I was going to confuse there. President Cheez it. Um, if there's a song to judge the album as a whole on, which is unfair to judge an album by one song, but it is fatal because that is the only brand spanking new song from the album. So it's the one they recorded especially for. It's music very interesting. It does bounce between the high end kind of punk and low end, low end kind of sludgy sort of sound. Um, both vocally and musically. And it plays around with speed more. So I'll go into a bit more detail in a bit. But the first half of the album and therefore the first EP. It's very slow. I'd put it more along the lines of sludge metal as I would to hardcore. Um, or straight up hardcore I should say whereas the second half and therefore the second EP is a lot more fast paced and it is a lot more akin to um, metallic hardcore punk um, with Fatal they do tend to well they have played around with both the speeds of the same sort of song which I do like I like it when um, hardcore bands sort of like play around with speed so it's not just like all one thing the entire way through um, moving on to Blue Lies Blue Lies, the opening to that might be the heaviest thing this year. Uh, the drum fills in between each um, stroke of the guitar. 
it just still now I'll probably listen to that first 30 seconds and then just repeat 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 because it's just so great um the more I go on the second half of the album the more I found that the key points I was making for each song kind of overlap so I was constantly saying about how the in- increase in tempo makes it more interesting more interesting for myself again it's down to personal preference um they do play around with tempos more often so like I said they balance a little bit more between more fast paced more um slow down breakdown sort of stuff um in song the song evil I noticed it more in evil than anywhere else they use a higher register screamer as well in the chorus and to hear that like guttural but like high end scream screaming evil at you it it pretty nail on the head it does do exactly what it says on the tin Ronzil and yeah they still install that low end stuff for the breakdown I think evil might be the evil or blue lies probably one of the, the, the best songs on the album um, first day aggression for me then was the second well it wasn't for me it was in fact the second al- um, second EP to be released I'm reading my notes as I go along I do apologise um, and it's a clear sign that after um, Ultimate Disease, they did start to play around with their sound and start adding to it and improving to it. And as a whole, between the two ends of the album, the metalcore term, both halves are covered. If you want the more like metal side of things, you've got the first half. And I'll include Fatal in that bracket as well. I think they're a lot more... Fatal's a lot more chuggy and... Um, like slow down compared to the second half, which yeah, if you do prefer the more fast paced hardcore sound, which I do, I'd personally go for um like blue lies onwards. Fail is evidence that they do seem to be trying to blend those two characteristics of the sound together. And it's like I said, it's hard to judge it based on that one song. And I think when they have more spoken and more eloquently put reviewers talk about how they could do that i think album two will be where they realize that sound the combined two ends of what they like to do and i think yeah album two should and will be where they realize that new sound and yeah i'll keep an eye out for that i'll give it a, a fancy old listen because that's what i apparently do can't talk about it though apparently if you are a fan of hang the bastard uh, crowbar or if you are fully indebted into your UK hardcore scene you remember a band called Pariso I think you'll go for this uh, it is the debut album from Year of the Knife it's called Ultimate Aggression and yeah check it out if you like your head being stomped cool so after we struggled through all that that was the album reviews for this week and we're going to end up with still one more to go the open mic album for this week and it comes from Sweden Gothenburg to be precise it is In Flames 2006 album Come Clarity it was their 8th studio album and at this point they were very firmly in the middle of playing an alt metal sound and the excuse me more old school melodic death metal sound this was the follow up to 2004's soundtrack to Your Escape which was largely rejected by fans even the newer ones um critics like critics like that they kind of said it was a natural progression from reroute to remain but at the end of the day the people are going to buy you sh- buy your merch and buy your tickets to see you play but the fans and you need to- it's bad but you need to keep them happy it's it shouldn't be like that you should be able to do what you want but yeah it's the fifth album to feature what became known as the classic lineup for in flames you had Anders Frieden on vocals, uh, Jesper Strumblad on guitars, Bjorn Jalot on guitar, also on guitars, I should say, Peter Ewers from, no, not from anyway, from In Flames actually, he was on bass and you had Daniel Svensson on drums, and they've been together since 1999's Colony, so they had been playing melodic death metal together, and as a group, they had also been manufacturing this new dare I say, commercial sound together as well. So it was always a group effort to try and make, like, coordinate this new vision for the band going forward. 
And I picked this album for because I ran a poll. It's going to be this or While She Sleeps. I expecting While She Sleeps to win. Turns out not. Um, I was expecting. So I picked this thinking it was going to be the Inflame album. I thought it was going to be the album that both sides, so the older Mellow Death fans and the newer alt metal fans, could both enjoy. And it was both prosperous, and this was where Inflame peaked. I was very wrong. I was so very wrong. This album has split the fan base down the middle. To which, so if you go on to Encyclopedia Metallum, the, old, the metal archives. And the review scores for Come Clarity are just, they are literally opposite ends of the spectrum. So just from bottom to top, you've got 40, 23, 75, 10, 80, 80, 79, 90, 80, 66, 56. There's a 25 in there as well. There's another 19. There's a 95. It is, no one can agree whether or not this is the best or worst. Um, I don't think it's the worst. People keep saying soundtrack to your escape is the worst, but not here on that. Or um, again, the worst is up for the bait. The best is up for the bait. This is very much in the middle of both camps. So nice, easy one to do. So we'll go for like a bit of an introduction to Inflames. They are considered pioneers of the melodic death metal genre. They helped pioneer the sound that's been later known as the Gothenburg metal sound along with bands like Dark Tranquility and At The Gates. Um, and since 2000's Clayman, Inflame started going through a new direction with their sound. So this was on the back of... Let me get the albums again, because I can never remember all around. So yeah, Lunar Strain, The Jester Race, and Horacle, they were out-and-out out, um, melodic death metal. Colony and Clayman started to play with more streamlined, a bit softer sort of sound, but not too much to stray away from what they were known for and then it was reroute to remain that really hit home this new direction and there was more clean vocals um lots more keyboards and there was a lot of alt metal influence at the time bear in mind it was 2002 so new metal was at its peak at this point and to the point where there's lots of moments on this out on reroute to remain that sounds a bit like edgy corn. So by the time Soundtrack to Your Escape came round, like I said before, critics saw, sort of saw Soundtrack as a natural progression from Reroot to Remain, but it was lambasted by fans. There's way too much keyboard, it's bad production, particularly on guitars, which I agree with. It does sound all one big fuzzy mess. Um, it's poor guitar work in general, and there's weird vocal effects because at the time, I don't think Anders was particularly comfortable with cleans. I think he's got a lot better now. But the first Inflames album I ever heard was Sounds of a Playground Fading. And the lead single from that was Deliver Us. And I thought the cleans in there were great, personally. But again, something else that's a bit torn between fans. And yeah, as a whole... Soundtrack to Your Escape was kind of seen as disaster. So Come Clarity was accidentally a make or break album. They either had to revert back and make their old fan base happy. Or they had to get this new modern metal sound that they were going for down to a T. To appease the new fan base that had been brought in from Reroot and Soundtrack. And you'd be forgiven for thinking they had gone for option A and gone back to their older sound with take this life because like even to this day it remains a live favorite from both camps it is a very very fast-paced riffy melodic death metal song with the huge searing vocals and yeah just from this album alone, i know i said about it from sounds of um and this seems to have a lot better control over its voice at this point and it feels more natural. There's less effects in there as well. And less auto-tune. So, you know, it, it's him. It's not a computer. Um, from there it goes into Leeches. Which sounds like Inflames' first attempt at trying to blend the two eras together. The old and the new. Um, there are... The riffs are back and the riffs are clear, clear and clean. And it's punctuated by the keyboards. The keyboards as a whole in the album are a lot subtler. 
um, to the point where even I was forgetting with headphones on listening for them. You kind of forget that they are there as a whole. Um, and yeah, they primarily used in the pre-chorus for leeches, but otherwise, yeah, they sort of just like carry the sound instead of being the sound, if that makes sense. Uh, you can already tell that production is a lot better on this album. The guitars have their own identity. The bass sounds fucking wicked on this album. It sounds so, so good. Um, Reflect the Storm is their first right into the new sound for the album. And it's a very like mid-paced, a lot of metalcore harmonies in there. And like, the it's got a very delicate chorus that's like drowned in crash cymbals. Like every single one being hit at the same time, which is very indicative of that kind of music. Again, very fun song. It's part of the course of what they were trying to do. So, just in the first three songs, you've got a song for the OG crowd, the fans that have jumped the board, Circa, Rewrit to Remain, and the middle ground for which to potentially build on in the future. That being said, I would love to have known how many fans got pissed off when it came round to Dead End, and they realised that In Flames had brought in a Swedish pop star, uh, Lisa Miskowski, which I hope I've done that just as name. I probably haven't. I'm pretty sure it's a part Czech name, which I'm shit. I would. Mm, I wrote this down. I'm. I'm gonna go with it. The chorus to Dead End it may be the best chorus in the whole album. I keep thinking of. I really like the song Scream, which I'll talk about a bit more in a bit, but. Yeah, the way it sort of like bounces between Lisa's very delicate voice and Anders still screaming in the chorus, even though she, he's with this like pop-centric vocalist. Um, yeah, I still love the fact that they were still taking risks and catering to what they want to do deep down, despite the fact that, like I said before, it's a very make-or-break kind of album at this point. As I said, Scream potentially is one of my, if not the favourite song for me from the album. The lyrics are super cringy, but I don't know what it is. It's got this weird like punk rock feel to it. Svensson's drums on here are absolutely top notch. They are so fucking great. Um, the little feels here and there just to keep the sound going along. The trade off between um, his double kick death metal kind of um, drumming and the more modern like metalcore alt metal kind of thing. As well, I thought, yeah, Scream is everything I want from a, from like an angry Melodess song, I guess. Mostly because it's punk as fuck. Um, the second half of the album, after Scream, kind of just feels like it's a continuation from all the trends and styles they set off in the first half. So, the first half of Come Clarity is a lot more iconic, and then that like sets the stage. And then the second half is just repeating those um, like tropes as they set up. Uh, the standout songs are, first of all, we've got Crawl, Th Crawl Through Knives. Um, it's the first song in a while where the keyboards have a featured prominence. And, yeah, as I say, kind of like alluded to before, like, the keyboards on the album don't saturate, well, don't saturate, sorry, the album's sound as much as what I've heard from Riru and Soundtrack. Um, they are used to complement the instruments instead of overwhelm them, which I think is a very, very key difference compared to what they're doing before and what other bands have done. And um, what other bands continue to do, actually, look at a lot of Gent bands, and Gent is a very guitar-centric brand of music. But on a lot of... And yeah, they've got, like, keyboard use here and there, but you've got some bands who make the keyboard the lead instrument, which some genres that works, like um, prog rock and symphonic, um, symphonic metal and that kind of thing, but Gent is... Gen and Melodic Death Metal isn't really a keyboard kind of genre. They are more for the guitars and more for the drums and more for the bass and even more for the vocals. Um, and yeah, so I think at this point, Inflame started to realise how to use a keyboard a lot better. Um, and his voice, his clean voice, I should say, peaks in the choruses here. Um, I've heard bits of the other two albums where he does there's a lot of flack aimed at Anders based on his clean vocals and I never quite understood it like I said I got in a 
playground fading and I thought his vocals were perfectly fine, perfectly capable. In fact, I quite enjoy them. And I couldn't understand why everyone was hating on them. Listen to the other albums and thought, yeah, he was he was learning by doing, which is fair enough. It's the only way you really learn anything in this world is by just giving it a bash. Um, and yeah, to move on, there they always had Iron Maiden as a benchmark in the sound. Um, uh, Stromblad has come on record to say he, well, I don't know if he said it. Basically. He found the band to try and mu- write music that combined the melodic guitar style of Iron Maiden with the brutality of death metal. And I think this is the most Iron Maiden song In Flames have done, at least what I've heard so far, in Vanishing Light. It's far, it's hugely fast-paced, but so equally hugely melodic. Um, and the riffs on there, on the chorus, and the, just before the solo, they are very Iron Maiden trad metal and I think almost borderline power metal at times to really, like, carry the song home. Uh, Come Clarity as a whole acts as a middle ground for a lot of In Flames fans. Like, just reading through reviews and forums and that kind of thing, every time they rank albums in order, no matter what end of the spectrum you're looking at, Come Clarity usually sits somewhere in the middle. Um, It very rarely is towards the top but equally rarely towards the bottom it is literally just that middle ground that keeps both sides relatively happy um and as someone who's more familiar with modern in flames i can see it's been a great gateway album for me to go back into early back catalog like um the jester race horacle colony and that kind of thing but i wouldn't necessarily say the other way around um there's more of an overlap in riffs from Come Clarity than the first four albums or so. Um, so there's a lot more like similarities there. But as much as I said it is, it does act as a middle ground. There's less in common with latter day In Flames. I would say A Sense of Purpose has a lot more in common with... Uh, well, sorry, A Sense of Purpose onwards has a lot more in common with like Reroot or Soundtrack or that sort of thing. So I think Come Clarity sits in its own little bubble. But it bridges that gap alone. So it's... I think I've been a bit uh, naive, I guess, just to assume that In Flames were down to two halves. I think up to Clayman is one era of the band. I think rewritten soundtrack could just be... It's like the demos that lead up to the modern day sound. So I guess they are kind of middle ground. Then Come Clarity sits alone. And then, yeah, from A Sense of Purpose onwards, that is this new era, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. I feel like I went in a bit narrow-minded with what Come Clarity represented. And it is a lot bigger than that. And I think I went in a lot more narrow mind of what In Flames were as a band. So, it's difficult. I'd be interested to find out what other people thought. Like I said, Come Clarity, I really enjoyed this album. And I know, from what I've read, OGs and New both like it as well. But I don't know if it's... I think if I listen to earlier stuff more, like Just the Race and Horacle... I'll be able to then figure out what end of the spectrum Come Clarity sits in. If it is, if it can, can be considered some of the older stuff, or if it does sit more with the newer end of things. Yeah, it's one that I struggle with. I've been trying to figure out how to like properly put it together, but yeah. Um, so what happened after Come Clarity anyway? Well, I talked about that a bit. Um, in terms of lineup. This, the classic lineup would release one more album. It would be A Sense of Purpose, and that came out in 2008. Uh, following that, in 2010, uh, Jesper Stromblad decided, well, announced that he would depart from the band. At the time, it was amicable. Um, he said it was to deal with personal demons, and the band gave him his blessing and said to, I guess, fix himself, in the most brutal way of saying that. Um, however, I have read that in recent years, the relationship between Strumblad and Fleden has apparently deteriorated, which is quite sad to hear. They've been like working as a band since... When did Anders join the band? Was it 92? 
95. So yeah, at that point, that was 15 years, but obviously you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. After Jesper left, he was replaced by a former Flames guitarist called Nicholas Englin. Um, he joined after 2011's Sounds of Playground Fading. Um, and to this day, he still remains. You, um, so outside of Anders and Bjorn, he is the longest standing member of the band. Because following 2014's Siren Charms, uh, Daniel Svensson announced that he was going to leave the band to focus on family life. He was replaced by former The Wedding, Red and Manifest drummer Joe Rickard, who would in turn leave after he recorded Battles in 2016. He was replaced by Tana Wayne, formerly of Kyodos and Scary Kids, Scaring Kids, which is a terrible band name. Terrible. Long-term bassist uh, Peter Ewers would also leave the band following Battles. He would be replaced by Ives bassist Bryce Paul. Um, Stromblad and Ewers have worked together on a supergroup called Kyra, Syra, a mel melodic metal band, um, which I think Ewers has already left. Um, he was only there for a year or so. And speaking of the devil, Ewers has also co-owns a brewery with Svensson in their nat native Gothenburg. So all the former members still apparently get on. It's just, well, not talk about Bjorn. It's, again, it's hard to figure out what is going on because we just don't know. We just don't know. Um, if I were to compare this era of In Flames with any of the band, my immediate points were soil work. Um, after doing a little bit of digging, I compared them to Children of Bottom loosely, as well as Malefice from the UK. So I imagine at this point... It, like, if you're into this end of the music, you are already into or already aware of In Flames. You've already made a decision of whether or not you like them. Um, but yeah, like I said, it strikes me as weird. I, without context, and it's probably down on more, well, it is down on me. Without context, I don't know where to, where Come Clarity sits in the grand In Flames scheme of things. But. If nothing else, it's got me wanting to go back and listen to those old albums to find out where it does all sit. Um, so yeah, I hope that's done come clarity justice. If not, do let me know. Usual social medias apply at Desolation Pod. Um, but until then, I have no idea what we're going to be looking at next week. It's a surprise for you and it's a surprise for me. Um, but I will see you then. And until such time, I will see you then. Yeah. Hopefully next week I'll learn how to read and talk. Bye.